So I, I think we go for the, the last uh, lecture and there was a last minute um, <laughs> dropout. So I think Mehmet, one of the tasks of a moderator is also to replace <laughs> a speaker. Uh, so I, I'm giving uh, my lecture to replace uh, uh, Dr. La Fuente on, on um, cervical arthroplasty. Okay. So uh, as you get, as you know already, I'm from Portugal. I have no disclosures relevant for this presentation, and um, you know I think there is a cost uh, noise, uh, which is not certainly a patient-related factor when we discuss about fusion or arthroplasty. Unfortunately, in my country, I have no bias because the implant cost and the surgeon reimbursement for cervical arthroplasty is roughly the same for fusion. So I'm not biased, I can use whatever implant, I think it's more suitable for the patient. And uh, the topic our, of our meeting today is uh, cervical degenerative disc disease. And you look here that uh, there is significant motion at subaxial spine where DDD is more prevalent. And if you choose to do fusion, uh, you, you originate motion loss and stiffness. And as you see here in this biomechanics study, arthroplasty shows similar features to an intact uh, segment. And this is what you get when you do arthroplasty with 10 years outcomes, long-term preservation, the range of motion, despite the occurrence of 42% of age show in, in this patient. Uh, this is a study that we've done with my PhD student, Philippe Pagaimo, and we show that after one year, uh, using uh, this kind of prosthesis, uh, mobile core prosthesis, the center of rotation uh, normalized in this position one year after surgery. And this is very important. This is critical for outcome. As an, a, a change in center of rotation will negatively affect segmental and global range of motion. What happens to the adjacent levels? Significant hypermobility, especially in, in superior disc levels when you do a CDS. Uh, looking here at long-term results, 10 years, hypermobility did not occur in adjacent segments. Also, uh, you increase the intradiscal pressure. It's not only hypermobility, it's also increasing intradiscal pressure of adjacent segments. And the combination of two will speed up adjacent segment disease. And if you look at uh, multi-level fusion and aging, uh, with aging, you normally increase your cervical SVA, and this will increase normally, uh, enormously the adjacent disc load. The, the pressure in the discs will be increasing with the changes in SVA. Um, and if you do multi-level, this just amplifies the increase in stiffness and the, the increasing range of motion of adjacent levels. So you agree with me that this rigid construct is very different from this situation where you can preserve motion. And Mo bending forward is most effective. There is 40% reduction with multi-level anterior cervical fusion. And this is the, the range of motion you need for uh, daily uh, situations like tying shoes, backing up a car, washing hair. And this is what you lose when you do on sagittal plane, on coronal plane, horizontal plane, when you do multi-level. So I think multi-level uh, fusion has a negative impact on cervical spine. Uh, global functional status, and that these are poorly tolerated when you assess quality of life in patients, especially young patients with higher life expectancy. They are not all happy as this uh, lady here. And uh, multilevel fusion comes also with pseudoarthrosis, and here are listed the rates of pseudoarthrosis. The more levels you do, uh, the more pseudoarthrosis you have, and need for reoperation is almost one quarter of patients. Uh, adjacent segment conditions as well. Uh, this is one of patients that operated in 2014, ACDF, and developed adjacent segment disease. Uh, she had a completely disc collapse in C5, C6, C7, and I, I was able to reformat and insert this process on the adjacent levels and look how nice the alignment and the mobility over the years with 68 months of follow up. Um, second surgery is at the adjacent level. I, 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 the incidence is follow-up dependent. As you see here, the more you follow up the patient, the more you see difference between reoperation for arthroplasty and ACDF. Another study with another device showing uh, significant difference uh, in, in 
in, in a, a decent level surgery. Uh, what about the cost utility? Real world data from la large national insured database published by Radcliffe. Uh, cervical arthroplasty was 12% cheaper, and this is due to uh, less incidence of reoperation. You have also superior uh, clinical outcomes comparing uh, fusion with uh, with uh, ACDA. Uh, as, as shown in this paper with five years follow-up, cervical arthroplasty is highly cost-effective compared with low-level ACDF in long-term follow-up analysis, more than five years. So arthroplasty, higher overall hospital costs, but less reoperation, less complication rates, increased return to work. So it's quite effective surgery over the lifetime of a patient, assuming a procedure, a 20 years procedure survival. Uh, cervical arthroplasty is probably the most scrutinized implant in, in, in spine surgery. Many, many uh, uh, high quality data studies with different devices, long term outcomes, uh, show that there were not inferior results with arthroplasty. And the more levels you do, the better results you have. And I'm convinced that none of these uh, studies that I showed before we, were done with third, gener third generation devices where you have six degrees of freedom, and you probably will have better results with the compressible disc prothesis that will allow a more physiological location of the center of rotation and offloads also the facet and adjacent discs. So better quality and range of motion, uh, less hypermobility, less adjacent disease and reoperation. In order to validate arthroplasty, we need to understand what's the impact on, on sagittal alignment. As you've shown before, anterior cervical spine surgery, relief of pain, preservation of improvement of neurological function, and this is related with the quality of decompression, but it's also important to restore surgical alignment. Uh, and probably the most important is sorry, horizontal gaze. All other concepts can be somewhat arbitrary, and I show you here significant variation of normative values for low doses, for SDA, for T1 slope. Um, of course, uh, it's important to, to correct such imbalance because kyphosis and increased SVA leads to neck pain and myelopathy progression, uh, facet joint and adjacent degeneration. We look at, uh, at one of our earliest patients, 35 patients. These were the levels operated uh, and a, a good increase in uh, index level or doses and global uh, low doses. And increasing global low doses derived essentially from increase in index level low doses. This has been shown in this meta analysis, which so shows also that a low uh, pre op T1 slope is helpful in restoring sagittal alignment in kyphotic places. So, this will be the ideal patients for you to start to use uh, arthroplasty to correct sagittal balance. Uh, it's also a positive impact on the, the sagittal alignment of the adjacent levels as shown on this meta analysis, either in cranial or cattle uh, levels. So what about index level kyphosis? Um, we've shown that there might be a, ben a benefit on sagittal balance overall, but why kyphosis at index level is still a contraindication for arthroplasty? And this relies on the, the work of Keen, showing that only 13% of pre-op kyphotic index level became low dotted whereas one third of the patients that were pre-op kyphotic became lordotic. So it seems that arthroplasty is more efficient in correcting lower lordosis than index level lordosis. We did a study with 23 patients, 25 kyphotic levels, all kyphotic levels, these were the levels operating, and there was a significant increase in all patients. All patients that were kyphotic became lordotic, in contrast with the study of Keen with a different device. Increase in C2C7 angle, not significant, though reduction on the CVA, not significant, and pre op T1 tilt pre have no influence on the, the reversal of kyphosis. Just to show you the case, there was uh, kyphosis, no, disc, uh, no loss of disc height. Patient had, had a similar uh, disc, uh, cervical disc X ray one, op, one year before the operation, and look minus 13.2 kyphosis level. It was obviously a flexible kyphosis, but not fully reducible. As you see, in extension, there is still some degree of kyphosis. And with arthroplasty, a nice low dot increase at C5-6 uh, to, uh, to uh, 5.3 plus 5.3. So a, a remarkable 18.5 increase in low doses. So gain 
in, in range of motion along with better uh, central alignment. With, uh, re, as you see, with, uh, we applied the step, step view software with a nice uh, reproduction of the quality of motion. So reconstruction of segment low doses at index scaphotic levels is possible while preser preserving quality and, and range of motion. Uh, sometimes the device cannot do all, as you see here, and you have to apply some sort of osteotomy to reformat C5 vertebra and the disk space and log dot configuration and have a very nice from day one post op uh, log uh, alignment that were possible to maintain over the, the 36 months uh, post op. So we published this in Mehmet's book, Correction Techniques in Spinal Deformity. Uh, reducible segmental kyphosis, at least in my hands, is not a contraindication for cervical arthroplasty. What about multi level disease? Uh, the more levels you do, as you shown as shown here, the better the gap uh, over ACDF, more, the better results you have. Uh, in our study with five years period, consecutive patients, single surgeon, single device, we had 21 at two level, 11 patients at three and four levels. Uh, you see quite young mean age of patients, uh, an interesting follow up. And these were the, the five, six and six, seven more prevalent operated levels. And uh, in, in striking contrast with complete loss of mobility in, in four and three and four level fusion surgery, we had very good range of motion and good uh, um, uh, alignment, global and index level. And no difference if you perform and if you split the analysis between two level and three and four level. Uh, this is patients, kind of patients that I see more and more in my office. Uh, Certainly, fusion is an option, but it's, it's, it will be very hard for the patient. So we found uh, arthroplasty a very good solution for those patients. And some patients also nowadays come with these collapsed discs, uh, like this kind of patient with myeloridiculopathy, with compressive level, minimal facet joint, because they are still young, but the discs are collapsed. Um, almost a straight spine here. Uh, we do the discectomy and then we do this leverage maneuver to see if there is residual motion and then we insert uh, the arthroplasty instead of fusion. And look how nicely that the, we reconstruct the height of the disc from 2.6 to 6.6 .6 and all the other levels uh, like. Uh, and this uh, was good sexual alignment over 48 months with very good range of motion. So a lot of these multi-level uh, myelopathic patients, uh, young patients, it's I think arthroplasty is a window of opportunity to treat earlier patients with mild moderate forms of myelopathy with good clinical results. And this is 48 months asymptomatic. The compression was not uh, uh, compromised. Another patient, uh, same of kind of, of results and look at, at the significant increase in the disc height. We identified 28 patients. We have more than this now, but this was a study that we, we, we did. 48 years old patients, 39 levels. Look, the mean increase in this height, a good positive angulation and good range of motion. So I think in, in patients with preserved facet joints, uh, arthroplasty is doable in compressive, in, in, in a uh, collapsed disc height. And more collapsed discs showed higher increase in this height and also showed a tendency to higher range of motion. Of course, there are contraindications, significant facet on degeneration, modic changes, osteophytes, refusal of PLL, et cetera. Uh, so in multi-level disc disease, uh, each individual level should be considered for arthroplasty. You need to be carefully scrutinized to identify all these contraindications. It's important patient selection to risk and respect those contraindications. Poor candidates for arthroplasty are prone to more complications. And finally, very briefly, uh, and this is for me the most compelling argument for arthroplasty, especially in young patients, are the compensatory mechanisms, bio biokinematics. Uh, while you're aging, you tend to increase your cervical SDA. And what happens when you increase your SDA? There is an hyperextension at C0. Uh, C1 and the compensatory flexion at C C2 to C7. Uh, if you do a fusion in patients like this, young patients, 
you abolish these compensatory mechanisms that are very useful for the patient. Uh, so we did a four level atoplasty, this patient for level this disease and look at two years follow up, you see increase in SVA, increase in low doses, C0, C2, a decrease in low doses. Might not be in good direction, but that's what uh, is expected in this patient. Also this patient with a, with a uh, idiopathic hyperostosis, that we did remodeling, we did the uh, arthroplasty, and with uh, seven years follow up, uh, index level range of motion preservation with uh, very nice alignments. Uh, this growth is still mobile, and there was variations over the years at the angles five, six, and six, seven to adapt to global alignment. If you do a fusion, this is impossible. Uh, you know, just another case very quickly. And range of motion preservation coupled with positive sagittal balance that change over the year. Uh, you, you can read some of our thoughts on, on, on the case, this expanded education for atoplasty in the Mehmet's and, and Guti uh, book on cervical spondylopathy myelopathy, also published on the North American Neurosurgical Clinics, uh, an article about expanded indications for cervical uh, total disc replacement. So, as a conclusion, um, I think uh, atoplasty mitigates many of the negative biomechanical effects of ACDF at long term, shows superior clinical outcomes, less reoperation, higher cost utility. If you do multi level, these results are amplified to compare single levels. It can promote positive sexual balance alignment, and there's the capacity to, to reverse global and segmental kyphosis. In my end, at least, it's a reliable technique for unconventional cases like the dish case I show you, the collapse degenerate discs. And uh, as I, I pointed out, it's a window of opportunity to treat younger patients as compensatory mechanisms are preserved compared to uh, the fusion surgery. Thank you. Yeah, very nice talk. Uh Oscar, you have two, two questions written on the chat. Uh, right. One is the about the heterotopic ossification rate. Right. I mean, it, it's very variable in the literature, the ossification rate. Uh, the paper I show, it's about half of the patients. Uh, it's, it depends on a lot of factors. I think the most important factor for heterotopic uh, ossification is the end plate coverage by the prosthesis. The more you, you, you obtain a, a good end plate coverage, the less ossification you have. Uh, also bone wax, the anterior edge of, of the virtual body. Uh, always remove the OPLL, uh, the, the, the OLL, the posterior ligament, the PLL, because it's a scaffold for ossification. Uh, generous irrigation. Uh, don't use devices with keels and by doing that, you probably be able to reduce this figure of 50%. Uh, on that paper of multi-levels, we showed around 20% of heterotopic calcification. On the other end, also very nice paper showing that despite some degree of heterotopic calcification, proteins are, are, are still mobile. As I know, the, the incidence is about 20%. Yes. The other question is that, uh, uh, how do you make a decision uh, for the size of the prosthesis? Yeah, but it's not really different from from uh, ACDF. Most of the time, we use uh, six mi six uh, millimeters. Uh, some devices have also the choice of five millimeters, which in people from 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 China or Korea probably they, this is most adaptable uh, device, but the choice of the size is not very different from an ACDF. Um, it's important not to rely too much on indirect decompression as you obtain with, with ACDF, uh, because if you if you preserve motion, especially lateral bending, if you have not done a proper uh, uh, foraminal decompression in the limits of lateral bending, you can have a nerve uh, root uh, impingement and and recurrence of symptoms. So it's important to do a complete uh, decompression and certainly not use big implants because there will be facet joint uh, distraction and pain and uh, the chance of some subsiding. Oscar, can we can we tell that uh, 
this is not a substitution of anterior or posterior foraminotomy. This is a substitution of ACDF. Correct. Okay. Correct. And, you know, and I think, how I think do the, you... the, the previous speakers highlighted very well this difference. I, I think the anterior or posterior foraminotomy is a well uh, designed uh, option for uh, more lateral pathology, compressive pathology. Uh, of course, if you have more central pathology, ACDF or arthroplasty would be the, the, the choice. How do you comment uh, that two level arthroplasty is more beneficial for the patient than one level? How do you comment this? Yes. Uh, you know, if you look at my personal experience, Mehmet, I since the beginning, I was very biased. I think when you do one level ACDF, patients don't lose much mobility, okay? The problem comes with multi-level. So uh, all my, I, I'm very biased and a lot, I did a lot of multi-level cases instead of single level ACD, uh, uh, arthroplasty. And that's when you can see the difference because if you look at surrogate endpoints for outcome like uh, motion preservation, quality of motion, and also the satisfaction index of the patient, Certainly, the more levels you do, the better results you have because patients are have to keep their motion. They are not so stiff. I have a question. Uh, do you sometimes do hybrid uh, uh, anterior uh, arthroplasty and uh, ACDF or not? Of course, of course. You know, when you have multi-level disc disease, you have different levels or different stages of disc degeneration. And uh, of course, for more degenerated discs, slit discs, a fusion would be a, a good option. So you can do hybrid constructs and save uh, the most mobile uh, discs or for arthroplasty. And, you know, so certainly you have to choose between uh, spondylotic changes of the disc, also, some of the disc levels are less mobile, spontaneously less mobile, so it's not worth to, to insert a disc uh, relatively. So it's a combination of these two factors. But hybrid constructs are certainly very, very interesting and very good. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think as some participants may have get a confusion because there are multiple uh, choices, surgical options for a simple disc herniation. Uh, and uh, I will say similar things to what Jumur uh, has said, uh, but uh, actually my uh, current concept is that currently I do very few ACDF. Uh, and I prefer anterior or posterior for microforaminotomies, mostly minimally invasive ways. Uh, and uh, ACDF can be also can be just restricted to kyphotic and unstable cases. Uh, but arthroplasty can also replace this. Uh, I don't know the real indications. Uh, of the arthroplasty, and I'm not sure if its benefits are really very superior to ACDF. But recently, I do very uh, little uh, ACDF, mostly do anterior posterior foraminotomies. Yeah, Mehmet, but but if you, I think the topography of the of the compression is very important. If you have more centrally located herniation or, or, or osteophyte, whatever, I think it's very hard to do it from, from anterior foraminotomy or posterior foraminotomy. So, of course, if you have compression at the foramen level, this is certainly a very good option. And uh, as I told you, I'm doing more and more endoscop full endoscopic posterior uh, foraminotomies. I, I think it's a very elegant procedure. Patients are very happy. It's almost on a, on a day surgery base. Um, but uh, for for central discs herniation or osteophytes, I think there is still a role for anterior approaches, uh, anterior discectomy and fusion or 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 um, 
arthroplastics. Maybe our uh, other speakers may comment on uh, sure. the conclusions uh, of this meeting. Jumhur will want to say something, I think. Uh, yeah, but uh, medial uh, medial lesions does not cause uh, radiculopathy. So the, I think uh, the anti uh, uh, indications for anterior discectomy for radiculopathy is very rare. It should be a large disc herniation, central disc herniation, kyphotic. Yes, uh, ACDF is a option, but patient uh, just experience radiculopathy. So uh, it could be treated with uh, foraminotomy, whether anterior or posterior. I believe that posterior foraminotomy is, is a much safer option, uh, especially for beginners. As Professor Kim showed us, the, the V point is really the, 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 the landmark. Once you identify the V point, uh, you can expose very nicely the, the, the nerve root. Of course, it uh, depends on the level of the cervical spine you are, because uh, the projection of the disc in terms of the posterior elements can change. So depending on the level you are, you have to do a little bit more laminotomy, inferior or superior laminotomy to be able to expose the disc area. But certainly, it's it's a very elegant technique, and, uh, and patients are really satisfied. And you, you hardly need to do uh, more than fifty percent removal of the facepalm. It's very hard to see a case where all the foramen is is compressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice cam. As far as we are concerned, actually, we do more uh, anterior cervical approach. Um, as far as the foramen anatomy is concerned, that we use for um, soft disc, uh, for lateral soft disc. And uh, those results are extremely good. And I also prefer to do in patients where they have a very short neck, particularly at C6, C7, and C5, C6. So the neck is very short. And you find technical, um, expects technical uh, difficulty in exposure in the anterior approach, then I always prefer to go posteriorly. Uh, the, the point which Dr. Kim showed uh, using the bone scalpel to remove the osteophyte is fantastic because we use that in one or two cases, but that is good that if the nerve root is uh, easily retractable. Uh, if the nerve root is too much stretched, I think probably then we may have to think about a little bit worried about it. Now, if you don't have the bone, sca bone scapel, then the problem the smallest, the smallest little bit is 2.6 uh, 2 mm little bits may be sufficient. So, uh, as as we all know that we we had problems uh, uh, as far as getting procuring uh, the cervical uh, arthroplasty because cervical uh, disc uh, is very costly in India. And, uh, and we don't have a big system of uh, support from the insurance companies. And that's the only reason in Indian doctors are not doing very much of arthroplasty. And there was a time, there was a time about 15 years ago, there was a spurt of a large number of uh, disc replacements, particularly for some of the companies, like some of the, like the brand, brand is, you know, they, they were used in a large numbers and they were also, Indigenous uh, Indian market uh, also produced, um, you know, uh, the 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 mobile this uh, cervical uh, disc arthroplasty uh, implants. But finally, what happened was that uh, we had problems um, in in the in the cost effectiveness. Number one, and there was uh, no approval from the insurance companies. So I saw one of the. In the chat, I saw somebody has asked the same question: How to convince in in their country? How to convince the um, the insurance companies to say go ahead with the uh, arthroplasty? But I personally feel that arthroplasty is very good in soft disc, in soft disc young men, uh, young people with with good uh, you know movements. And it's not much of restriction. They don't have a big osteophytes or rigid uh, disc space, and they are very good for. Arthroplasty. 
we did did a little bit a minimum number of cases but not large, large number of cases uh, as far as the the anterior the zoos zoos technique and uh, uh, very very less uh, neurosurgeons do but uh, some do with um, zoo technique for the oblique corpectomy and the technique which uh, which which was shown was extremely good um, uh, so once once we know that the vertebral artery and the, the position of the vertebral artery because sometimes the vertebral artery is very, very rudimentary, very small in one, one area. That's, that's the best case to start with for any surgeon. That, that's my personal advice. Uh, I, I, we always used to do the 3D reconstruction with the angiogram. And uh, you find if the vertebral artery is very small and you are happen that the side of the uh, osteophyte is on that side. And that is the best case to do this Joseph technique. That's my feeling. Thank you. There is one Thank question you. for Insan Kim. Uh, the, uh, the question is that, do, do you have any opinion regarding UBE posterior decompression? Unilateral approach by, oh. by endoscopy. Yeah, that's an uh, uh, excellent question for Korean neurosurgeon. And uh, many Korean uh, uh, neurosurgeons and uh, some orthopedics uh, prefer UBE, that is uh, unilateral bipotal endoscopic uh, decompression. Uh, and it is a very uh, <clears throat> uh, low learning curve than uh, unipotal uh, endoscope surgery because uh, <clears throat> with assisted with uh, endoscope. It's just like uh, uh, open micro foraminotomy posterior uh, with uh, microscope. And uh, uh, so uh, the bipotal, uh, unilateral bipotal endoscope is promising because the learning curve is not steep. So uh, uh, I would like to uh, Come uh, with my friend uh, to uh, the uh, uh, Ismis Turkey and uh, uh, Spy Masters in October. Thank you. Thank you. I have a very technical question for Killington. When you do your anterior foraminotomies, what is the natural corridor for the soft tissue that you, that we, you use? Uh, how do how do you? What is the uh, corridor? Yeah, the natural, the natural corridor. Length? But do you no no? I mean, do you do the same for uh, an anterior classical approach? Yes, yes, same. But you don't need to, uh, you don't need to see the other side of the spine. You just midline is okay to get oriented. Okay, because the cases that I have done, I bounce medially everything. Internal jugular vein, the, the carotid artery, of course, is off is and through here, everything goes medially. And I go along the SC muscle. Mm. And I land in the longus coli muscle yeah. immediately. For uh, the anterior foraminotomy or obliquely? Yes. For, for the anterior foraminotomy, yes. Uh, and it's a natural corridor as well. You don't have any vessels, any, any nerves. You only higher up, you have the accessory nerve, but dealing with the subaxial spine, it's not a problem. So it's just a technical note. Here. That's that's how I, how I do it. Yes, but I find the medial medial corridor is much familiar. OK. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm very honestly speaking that if you push the carotids and the veins medially, it's much easier. Actually, uh, to me, sometimes I feel much safer. Um, because the you your esophagus is very far away, yeah. In you know esophagus is too far away, and uh, you can exactly over the muscle, and so the, the actual in in when we started this uh, anterior approach, many times we have gone lateral to the carotids, and we realized that that we are too. So, but that is now more familiar for this approach. Because even the drilling must be much easier, the angle of the drill. 
the angle of the drill to the osteophyte must be very quite easier than I don't know about what uh, Kumhum says, and, but he is comfortable with. I like I like to ask you one. I mean, one of these question is that you like to prefer to go on the, the the right side osteophyte through the right side or the left osteophyte to the left side. As, uh, anterior foramen anatomy. Yeah, yeah. For example, True. that if, yeah. you have, if, if you have one on the left side, uh, would you would you prefer to go the left side or from the right side? This is a the, it's a lateral surgery. Uh, yeah. if, if it oblique corpectomy, you can reach to both sides, but for anterior foramen anatomy, you need to choose uh, the ipsilateral side to the lesion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, me too. I always change my position according to the side of the lesion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to say something? Yes, I want. To, I write to do Oscar a questions on board, and I want to do ask the Oscar for multi-level atroplasty because. Uh, sometimes we see subsidence uh, for multi level atroplasty, and uh, biomechanics is different in upper level cervical and lower level cervical. In upper level flexion is more than lower level, and sometimes we see subsidence in uh, between C4 and C5 atroplasty. And what do you think we should choose hybrid system or different things? In our clinics, we use posterior macroforometomy and ICDF frequently, and we use very rare uh, atroplasty for only single level young patients and soft disks, for example. But do you see in your presentation a lot of multi-level atroplasty? Right. Yeah, thank you. Good question. You know, I, I don't think um, the principles of subsidence in cervical atroplasty are the same as ACDF. If you got a good end plate coverage, you don't violate the end plates while you're drilling. If you don't have a kyphotic uh, configuration at the end of the operation, I think you can avoid most of subsidence in, in, in atroplasty. I don't see, honestly, I don't see a big problem. What seems that can be a problem, and we are doing a study on that, uh, it's, it's starting to show on the literature, is anterior osteolysis with a, with a cervical atroplasty. That we don't really understand the nature and the timeline of this anterior osteolysis, which means decrease of the disc of the vertebral body height, anterior vertebral body height. I don't see much on my patients, but this is certainly something that we are studying now, calling all the older patients and look at them. We, we don't see it with the clinical significance, but it may exist. So we are calling all the patients now to, to, to make this study. So this might be a more relevant problem than subsidence. I think you, you if you keep the rules of uh, ACDF and you apply to atroplasty, you don't have much subsidence as well. So good and plate coverage, don't avoid a uh, kyphotic uh, configuration of, of, of the disc uh, at, the, at the end of the operation. Careful with drilling, you end up not having much subsidence. And regarding your ivory technique, uh, I think it's really useful. Uh, you know, I, this was not really the topic of my presentation, but it's cer certainly something I thought because um, as I explained, when you have multi-level disc disease, you have different stages of disc degeneration. So uh, some of the discs are more spondylotic, are, some are less spondylotic. Uh, so obviously you apply atroplasty to, to less spondylotic and fusion to more spondylotic levels. Or if you have some economical constraints, you can use ACDF in the less mobile level. And we know that cervical spine doesn't move all along with the same with the same amount of range of motion, so you, you can play a little bit on that. But Thank certainly, you. it's a very good option, and I do it. Thank you, dear Mehmet. Should we conclude? I think yes, yes. We are. <laughs> we you must come to the end. It was very nice uh, overview of. Uh, I congratulate all the. Uh, speakers. Thank, Thank you, you. And, uh, and congratulations you, for, for organizing this. Maybe uh, this
Uh, we can get a, a photo of all. Uh, yes, if yes. you open your uh, videos. Yes. Also, the participants, can you please open your videos? Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming to this meeting. Uh, I thank Oscar for moderation. And I, I thank uh, all the speakers. Thank you, Mehmet, for organizing. Hope to see you again. And, and Onur, also nice to see you. Onur, please continue to organize this way. It, we yeah. had very proficuous discussions and very technical details. So it, it, it was really useful. I learned a lot. Yeah. Thank you. from interior for from interior for